Good afternoon and welcome to Rediscovering the Truth. I'll be your host and teacher, Marquita Smith. I'm excited about continuing this series with you about Yeshua and the Gospels. We're reading out the book of Matthew right now and we're going to read starting in Matthew chapter 11. I'm doing this teaching out of the complete Jewish Bible because I really want you to see the Jewish Messiah. That's what's really important. Uh, we've had an image of Yeshua as um, Greek or uh, Western, you know, European, but of course he was Jewish and as he was teaching, he spoke from a Jewish cultural context and he spoke Hebrew idioms and other things that would have been known to his audience at the time who of course were mostly Jews and then some of them were Gentiles who were in the area of Judea and Samaria and then of course there was Galilee to the north where more of the Gentiles had moved in, but this was an, uh, an era where everyone sort of understood the Jewish culture. Um, because Rome had come in and taken over the Jewish culture. And so when he was teaching, most people understood the references that he was making. He gave many references to the Tanakh, or the um, what we often call the Old Testament. But Tanakh is the Torah, the Nevi'im, Prophets, and Ketuvim, which is the writings. So all of the, the Old Testament is referred to as the Tanakh. And you see him making many references to that because he's helping people to understand what he's come to fulfill. And so we're going to look at uh, the Jewish Messiah in the Gospels. And if you've not watched the the other uh, teachings, they are, of course, available on YouTube and on our website at truthandspirit.org. Um, just click Rediscovering the Truth. Or if you're watching on the webcast, you can click the banner above my head and it'll take you um, to that website as well where you can look at the previous teachings. And so I'm excited that you've joined us live or that you're watching it um, as a recorded teaching. And I hope that you will be blessed uh, by this teaching uh, where Yeshua is going to begin um, by speaking uh, with John's disciples. And he's talking about um, Yochanan or uh, John the Baptizer, or, which is going to be um, so important. I love this reference. It's actually, um, it was mentioned to me this morning. So starting in Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 out of the complete Jewish Bible. After Yeshua had finished instruct instructing the twelve Talmudim, which is disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns nearby. So he's instructing those who are close to him, his particular students who have committed to learning from him, and then he goes to other towns to just teach anyone who would hear. Meanwhile, Yochanan the Immerser, he's also known as John the Baptist, um, who had been put in prison, heard what the Messiah had been doing. So he sent a message to him through his Talmudim, because John, or Yochanan, also had students or disciples, those who were being trained by him. Um, two of Yeshua's uh, Talmudim were first John's Talmudim, um, John and Andrew. They were following uh, John the Baptizer or um, Yochanan the Immerser, and then they became Yeshua's Talmudim. But John still maintained some Talmudim, some followers, some students. And here he sends some of his <clears throat> Talmudim to ask Yeshua a question because he's now been imprisoned by Herod. Verse 3, they were asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for someone else? Yeshua answered, Go and tell Yochanan what you are hearing and seeing. The blind are seeing again. The lame are walking. People with zara'at, uh, which we uh, know as an infectious skin disease such as leprosy, they are being cleansed. The deaf are hearing. The dead are being raised. The good news is being told to the poor. And how blessed is anyone not offended by me. And many other versions say anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Um, meaning that they see the works that Yeshua is doing. They see the fruit. But if they look at the man himself. Um, Isaiah 53 says us very clearly that, that he was not one um, that was uh, good to look at. He was not one that was attractive. That we would be drawn to him. So they're looking at the man. They know his family. They know where he's born. They know where he was raised. They know his sisters and his brothers and his mother and his father. If they looked at the person of him, then they may get confused about what God is doing through him. But if they looked at the works, the things that were coming out from him, the fruit from him, then they should know that he was the Mashiach, the Messiah. Um, and this is what he's saying. Don't be confused because you become familiar with me or because you, you, you see me as a man. Watch what I'm doing. Pay attention to what God himself is doing through me and then you'll know who I am. And that's something that as believers we should do with each other. There are times when we can certainly confuse each other. Um, by the, the, the challenges that we come across, the weaknesses that we have, even sometimes our, our frailty, immorality, and sin um, can make people go, I don't know if God can, can still use that person or minister through that person. But God can use anyone. He use a donkey. You'll see that, of course, um, in Numbers, uh, where uh, Balaam is, is seeking the Lord to prophesy to, you know, over the Israelites' um, curses, 
because King Balak had um, sought him, but because Balaam is unaware that you know, the Lord has sent an angel to judge him, he opens the donkey's mouth, um, and the donkey is able to speak. And I say that to say, people use that reference all the time, not to excuse weaknesses or sins or, or failures. Um, in Yeshua's case, of course, there was no sin. He just wasn't attractive the way people would think a teacher would be. He didn't have necessarily the charisma or the outward appearance. He didn't have the pedigree, the background, the teachings, the trainings that people thought he should have. Um, he didn't grow up in the temple. He wasn't raised by Pharisees and priests and things like that. Um, and so looking at the man of him, it, it becomes really easy to get confused. Even what he starts to do and the way he starts to minister to people, which Yeshua is going to go to go into it a little later in this chapter, those things started to confuse people. Like, oh my God, he's doing this and he's doing that. How could he possibly be the Messiah? Because the Messiah wouldn't do that. The Messiah would do this. Uh, we all have our expectations of um, how God is going to move and, and through whom he will move. Um, you know, all of those expectations. And then when he uses regular human people, sometimes we get disappointed. Um, and Yeshua was fully God, but he was also fully man. And those who knew him, particularly his cousin, Yochanan, or his cousin, John, um, John was his cousin. John, the immerser or, or the baptizer, was his cousin. Um, and so, you know, that familiarity can make it really um, confusing. Plus, John himself was in a bad place. He's in a dungeon. He's being held for something um, that really was not a sin. He actually was convicting the king of sin. But he's now being held in prison. And no, he's awaiting his death. So he's losing hope. He's losing faith. Um, and as those things start to happen, we can really draw into question, you know, God, what are you doing? Um, you know what I mean? That can really become something that we we start to question when Yeshua is saying look don't be offended by me don't stumble by the man of me look at what I'm doing pay attention to what God himself is doing through me and that's going to help you because we can look at humans and get really off track get really confused it happens all the time humans can hurt us they can offend us um, you know this is what Yeshua is speaking don't be offended by me um, humans can disappoint us and as those things happen we can lose sight of what God is doing and get completely sidetracked and off track um, it, it's really easy to do because we are interdependent upon each other. But Yeshua is saying, don't do that. Pay attention to what my father is doing through me and then he himself will encourage you. Um, and this is what he is quoting when he was speaking all of that. He was actually quoting Isaiah 26, um, 19, where he was speaking of the good news is being preached to the poor and the deaf are hearing and the lame are walking and the blind are seeing. That's Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. And so what he's saying is what's written in Tanakh about the Mashiach, I'm doing it. So though I don't look like what you expect, and, and maybe I don't even act like what you would expect, I'm doing the things that the scripture said I would do. So believe God. Have faith in God, not humans. Have faith in God that he's doing what he promised. Um, this is what Yeshua is saying, and that's the message he sends back to Yochanan, uh, the immerser, while he's in prison, um, awaiting his execution. Verse 7. As they were leaving, Yeshua began speaking about Yochanan to the crowds. What did you go out to the desert to see? Reeds swaying in the breeze? No. Then what did you go out to see? Someone who was well-dressed. Well-dressed people live in king's palaces. New or, or no, not that. Um, so why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes. And I tell you, he's much more than a prophet. This is the one about whom the Tanakh says, See, I am sending out my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. And Yeshua is quoting Malachi chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Um, and he continues on in verse 11. Yes, I tell you that among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than Yochanan the Immerser. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the time of Yochanan the Immerser until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence. Yes, violent ones are trying to snatch it away. For all the prophets and the Torah prophesied until Yochanan. Indeed, if you are willing to accept it, he is Eliyahu or Elijah, whose coming was predicted. If you have ears, then hear. Now he's speaking about John or Yochanan because it was prophesied in the Tanakh that Eliyahu or Elijah had to come first. This again is in Malachi. Now it's in Malachi chapter 4. Yeshua just quoted Malachi chapter 3 saying that, you know, the Lord said he would send his messenger out to prepare the way of the people. And you want to continue reading on in Malachi 3. Yeshua only quoted verse 1, but continue reading in 3 and you'll hear more about this messenger that is to prepare the way. Then when you go over to Malachi chapter 4, um, in the complete Jewish it's all one big chapter, all Malachi 3. But in other versions, you'll see there's a Malachi 4 um, at the end of chapter 3. 
And it goes back again into this messenger that prepares a way. Um, Yeshua um, uh, is, is, is reminding us that in Malachi 4, it says to remember the law of my servant Moses, but then also says that I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and terrible day of the Lord. This is going to be in Malachi chapter three, I mean, chapter 4, uh, verses 4, 5, and 6. And so it's very important that we see that Elijah was predict predicted to come. It's prophesied that Elijah would come first before the Lord, the Mashiach, arrived. And Yeshua is saying, Elijah did come. This is the one who's just asked, am I the Messiah? Am I Mashiach? This is important because if Elijah didn't come first, then Yeshua couldn't be Mashiach because he fulfilled all things in uh, in order and in the way um, that the Lord himself prescribed them. Um, even when Yochanan immersed him, he said, let us do these things so that everything uh, will be you know, fulfilled. And so he's immersed by Yochanan so that he's connected with those scriptures um, where Yochanan is preparing that way. And then, of course, Yochanan sort of ushers him in. And when Yochanan sees him, or John sees him, he says he must increase and I must decrease because Yeshua is now carrying the message forward. And we'll see that as we continue on prayerfully. We'll get to it today um, in Matthew chapter 14, where Yeshua continues on the message of Yochanan um, after his death. So now Yeshua continues on in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 11. And he says, Oh, what can I compare this generation with? They're like children sitting in the marketplaces, calling out to each other. We made happy music, but you wouldn't dance. We made sad music, but you wouldn't cry. And you'll see in uh, many versions, the sad music is called dirges, or I played a dirge, and a dirge is going to be a, a sad song. Um, and what's happened here is what he's saying is you, you all keep, um, you're unresponsive. Uh, there is a call to mourn and you don't mourn, which would be repentance. There's a call to be joyful and celebrate and you don't celebrate. John came with a dirge. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You brood of vipers, who's told you to flee the coming judgment? And so he's bringing everybody to this place of, of really, you know, of, of great introspection, looking at myself and seeing how I have not fulfilled the scriptures. I have broken the covenant over and over and over again. I keep doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm unfaithful to God. I'm not able to keep his commandments. And so uh, 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 people are broken and they're humble during Yochanan's time, you know, where he played the dirge. He plays this song that should draw a sad response. Then Yeshua comes and he's saying, I am the Messiah. He reveals himself. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. Yochanan didn't come with those signs. Yeshua comes with the miracles because he's bringing merriment with him. Happiness, good news, which we also call the gospel. And we're reading from one of the gospels now. Um, that good news that Yeshua brings with him, again, he spoke of it earlier while he was quoting Isaiah uh, 61, verse 1, that, that he's bringing that good news of the kingdom. Um, it, it becomes so important to recognize here that um, both happened. A call to mourn and repent. And people didn't respond. You know, some people did, but the whole nation didn't. The religious leaders, of course, didn't. Um, then you see a call to merriment, a call to feasting with the bridegroom. He's come. Mashiach is here. And there is some mixed response. They're happy about the miracles. But, of course, we see, because we know the end of this story, if you've read through the, the book of Matthew or any of the Gospels at the end, of course, everyone turns on Yeshua. He's crucified. So, clearly, they didn't respond to the, the good news that Mashiach had come, which you see in Isaiah 61, verse 1. This good news that he's fulfilling and he's bringing that good news. They don't respond uh, rightly to it. And so, he's saying this generation is just not responding rightly. When they're supposed to mourn, they're not mourning. When they're supposed to rejoice, they're not rejoicing. Uh, they, they've turned gladness into sadness and sadness into gladness. So the seasons are off. The responses of the people's hearts not right. Um, and each one of us should be able to identify with that. When God is calling us to repentance and we're hardened, we don't repent. God is calling us to, to worship Him, but we're preoccupied. We're doing other things. Um, or we're saddened when we should be worshiping. Uh, but God wants right responses from us, that we would enjoy him when he comes to minister to us, but then also that we would mourn and, and lament um, over the sins of our nation and repent when it's time to repent, because it is time um, that we would be sensitive to the moves of God and what he's saying, that it, we would do it in season when he's calling us to, um, and be repentant when we're to be repentant and be joyful when we're to be joyful. Verse 18, Yeshua is continuing, continuing on to express about this generation. But Yochanan came fasting, not drinking. So they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating freely and drinking wine. So they say, aha, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So basically Yeshua is saying, look, like I just expressed to you, doesn't matter what we do. He's fasting, 
you don't receive him. I'm drinking and eating and, and, and bringing merriment. You don't receive me. So it doesn't matter how God sends the message. You're not happy with the message of the messenger. Um, then he continues on in verse 19 to say, Well, the proof of wisdom is in the action it produces. Meaning, you may not be sure of Yochanan and, and where he got his, uh, his, his uh, 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 anointing. But then you also may not be sure of me and where I get this power or this anointing. But watch our fruit. Yochanan produced repentant people and a people ready for Messiah. And Messiah is producing a, a people that can join the kingdom and can uh, partake in the wedding feast. A people ready to dwell with God in heaven, um, to, to be heavenly minded. And he's saying, watch that fruit. If you're not sure what's going on, if you're not sure how to respond, watch that fruit. Watch what's happening. And, and I'll show you how you should respond. Verse 20. Then Yeshua began to denounce the towns in which he had done most of his miracles because the people had not turned from their sins to God. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Why, if the miracles done in you had been done in Zor or Zidon, or that's Tyre and Sidon, those are places in uh, Syria, they would long ago have put on sackcloth and ashes as evidence that they had changed their ways. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for, bearable for Zor and Zidon than it will be for you on the day of judgment. And you, Kafarnachum, or Capernaum as we call it, will you be exalted to heaven? No. You will be brought down to Sheol, that is the place of the dead. For if the miracles done in you had been done in Sodom, which is Sodom, it would still be in existence today. For I tell you that on the day of judgment, it will be more bearable, bearable for the land of Sodom than for you. Which becomes so important that we recognize that Yeshua is not speaking now of just individual judgment. Now he's also speaking of regional judgment. Not just the judgment of individual humans, but the judgment of whole cities. Which, if, if whole cities can be judged as regions, then so can whole nations. Revelations makes it very clear to us um, that two-thirds of all the earth is going to be burned up with fire. And Yeshua is telling us here, what's the criteria for that burning? Who determines which regions of the earth are going to be burned with fire? These regions that have rejected him. Whole regions that have rejected him. Now, whole regions can reject him. That means whole regions can receive him also. And those regions will be redeemed so that they would be a part of the one-third that's not burned up by fire um, that we see in Revelation. Um, so it's very important that we recognize that there is an individual judgment for individuals. We see that um, in Revelations, uh, Revelation chapter 20 where the judgment seat, um, where the, the king comes, the Ancient of Days, he sits on his judgment throne and all the dead are, are raised before him and each one um, learns their fate, whether they're going to eternal judgment or to eternal life with him. But there's also a judgment um, or a redemption for towns, regions, and nations. That, cause, well, that will cause us to pray even harder. Um, there's a wonderful book written by Bishop Dominica Beerman called Sheep Nations. And she talks about whole nations being saved, whole nations receiving um, the, the gospel or the good news. Um, you can order it on her website at uh, kadesh.org, which is k-a-d-e-s-h.org. Um, um, and look up her books, um, Sheep Nations. But it will help you to understand that Yeshua himself came to whole regions as well. Even when he sent the Talmudim, he told them to dust, wipe the dust off their feet if a, if a town didn't receive them. It wasn't just about individuals receiving, it's about whole regions. Um, and as, as ministers of the good news, as those ambassadors for the kingdom, a lot of times we think about the individual salvation, but we miss that he's trying to do something regionally. Um, this ministry has been focused on, on regional ministry for quite some time. Um, ever since we've been in existence, I think, actually. Um, but for the last two years, we've been really focusing on the tie with the region. Whole cities and then the, the region as a whole as the birthplace of a nation so that the, the United States could return to being a sheep nation. Um, we began as a lamb, but then um, really just evolved into this terrible uh, goat that is rebelled against God. The goat's on the left side, the side of, of being cast aside, and then the, the sheep on the right. And this nation needs to go back to being a sheep nation, to learn to be a sheep nation, to follow Israel's example in the scriptures, and even uh, contemporary Israel now that is seeking to fulfill the scriptures of God as opposed to doing things according to the Western mindset um, that has been put before us, um, the Hellenistic way of doing things, which includes conquering um, and performance and the reason of man as opposed to um, sharing the truth with people and giving them a choice 
Um, and then also using the wisdom that God gives through his scriptures and the revelation he sends through his Ruach HaKadosh. And then also that redemption um, that comes by grace and forgiveness and love. Uh, this is the way the Lord would have us to minister. And this is the way he would have us to live. Forgiving ourselves first, but then also forgiving those around us who have wronged us. And releasing them um, from that place in our heart where we have held them captive um, by bitterness and resentment. And so he's saying that there is a place of judgment. For whole regions, whole cities, and it's in Sheol, that place of the dead, um, where we know that human souls go there, of course, when they die. But now he's saying whole regions would be cast into that place. Verse 25. It was at this time that Yeshua said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you concealed these things from the sophisticated and educated and revealed them to ordinary folks. Yes, Father, I thank you that it pleased you to do this. Now he's speaking of the fact that those who were religious at the time didn't understand it or they would have been evangelizing or sharing the good news or the truth of the Hebrews of our faith, the truth of the Tanakh. They would have been sharing it with whole regions, not just individuals. They would have been ministering to whole cities, whole towns, that they might be, um, that the whole city might repent and turn back to God. Um, verse 27. My father has handed over everything to me. Indeed, no one fully knows the Son except the Father, and no one fully knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son wishes to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who are struggling and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is so essential, um, what Yeshua is ministering here, because He's saying... Um, that though those who were learned didn't understand, those who are not learned will, will, will receive truth if they come to him. And if, if we come and we, we release the striving, the trying to advance the kingdom in our own strength, we release the religion of, of trying to make ourselves holy instead of addressing the true sin and filth within our own souls. If we can come to him honestly and in integrity, if we can love each other honestly and in integrity, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and allow God himself to cleanse with the blood of Messiah, then we will be free <clears throat> from the yoke of bondage to sin and a yoke of bondage to, to religion <clears throat> and slavery that keeps us away from the grace that he has uh, uh, so uh, uh, willingly provided for us. He wants us to have shalom, uh, rest, peace, and wholeness and our souls, instead of the burdens of sin and the burdens of religion and man-made laws and rules of how to do this and how to do that, but just releasing ourselves to receive from him that we might be forgiven and we might be restored and that we might minister that forgiveness and restoration to other individuals and to whole regions. Verse, uh, chapter 12. One Shabbat during that time, Yeshua was walking through some wheat fields. His Talmudim were hungry, hungry, so they began picking heads of grain and eating them. On seeing this, the Parashim said to him, Look, your Talmudim are, uh, are violating Shabbat. But he said to them, Haven't you ever read what David did when he and those with him were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was prohibited both to him and his companions. It is permitted only to the Kohanim, which is the priest. And David wasn't a priest. He um, began the line of kings leading up to Mashiach. Verse 5, Or haven't you read in the Torah? That on Shabbat, the Kohanim profane Shabbat, and yet are blameless. I tell you, there is in this place something greater than the temple. And of course, he's speaking of himself in the Ruach HaKadosh. If you knew what I want compassion rather than animal sacrifice meant, you would not condemn the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of Shabbat. And what he's saying here is so beautiful. He's actually addressing what I just was speaking of in chapter 11. Where he's saying, not, you, you shouldn't be in bondage to sin, of course. But you also shouldn't be in bondage to religion. Read all the Tanakh and you'll understand that you that you got to know the Father himself to really even be able to apply the scriptures. And that's not just the Tanakh, the Old Testament, Testament or Old Covenant. It's also the Brit HaDashah or the New Covenant. We've got to know the Father and receive the Ruach HaKadosh to even try to put this in place. Otherwise, the spirit of religion is going to try to teach us how to do it through our own reason and understanding and through the man-made rules and laws uh, that were set by other religious people, which really puts us back into bondage instead of setting us free. We've been um, uh, blessing the Lord with seven burnt offerings, which are deliverance. Each burnt offering is a deliverance because we started in Shavuot. And one of those deliverances is the spirit of religion, being delivered from the spirit of religion. And I'm going to tell you, 
that is the one that I'm currently being delivered from. My goodness. Um, religion and also paganism and syncretism because those two kind of work at opposite ends of a spectrum just to keep God's people going back and forth at like a ping pong on, on a, a ping pong table like a ball on a ping pong table it's been horrible paganism has us worshiping idols and ourself and our flesh can be one of those idols uh, which just it's just a horrible uh, a nasty defiling sin but then we've got religion on the other side that says, well, I don't want to be in sin, so let me create all these rules and listen to human rules um, and outside of revelation through the Father as to what I should do. And I'm going to put those rules in place to try to keep myself free from sin. It lasts only a short time. Then we go right back to sin, and then we're a mess, and, we, and we're condemned by the enemy, and we say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just a mess, and then we walk away from God, and we do whatever our flesh or our idols dictate. And then we say, oh, I don't want that life. I want, I want to be uh, holy. And we go back to religion and try to put the boundaries in place to keep ourselves intact but all of it is really done out of our own flesh and our own reason none of it is going back to God saying Lord I need you to minister to me I need you to heal me I need you to keep uh, um, my flesh in check and deliver me from that sin sickness that's in my soul this is what uh, uh, God himself has sent Yeshua to do for us and Yeshua was ministering that in, in um, chapter 11 verses 28 through 30, that same deliverance that we're receiving, we're continuing to receive it. Not just a shovel oak. The Lord said very clearly, you're going to need to do this for a long time. This is not a one-shot deal. This is some serious mess in us. And he's going to have to pull it out piece by piece by piece by piece. And it is coming. I mean, I'm just blessing the Lord so much that it is coming. This Saturday, the Shabbat at 2 p.m., I'll be teaching about paganism and syncretism. Again, one of those things he is yet delivering me from. He's still pulling it out of me and pulling it out of all of us because it goes so much deeper than we think it does. Um, idolatry is all around us and we have so many idols in our soul that oftentimes we don't even recognize that we're in idolatry which is adultery to God. So then we start to see the spirit of adultery rise up in ourselves and we don't understand where it's coming from but it's that idolatry um, that's the basis of it. And now that he's revealed it, it's being stirred up in our souls and it's at the top and he wants to take his... Um, his, his, his own sickle and just pull that off, pull that defilement off of us. But we've got to get to the place where our sin becomes just ugly to us too. And we say, Lord, you've got to take it away from us. We recognize it and we release it to him. Whether it's the sin sickness of paganism and syncretism or whether it's the cover-up of religion. Um, which, very honestly, um, can mask itself so clearly and has been fooling me for years. And so the Lord is just revealing it um, in this season what that looks like. And the fact that we've got to be free from that because it's, it is that spirit of religion that makes us feel like this walk with the Lord is burdensome. This walk with the Lord is hard. When it's not true. It's not burdensome. It's easy and it's light. He said it very clearly and he is not a liar. So then that means that there's been an additional burden put on us. And Yeshua is addressing it right here in Matthew chapter 12. He's saying, you don't understand what keeping the Shabbat is all about. You're thinking it's about these rules that you've set up that make you holy, but those rules actually separate you further from God because it's like you're thinking that you can figure out how to please Him when instead you really ought to be seeking Him because He will show you how to function on Shabbat, how to really worship Him. He, and He gives these examples that don't match up with the doctrine. One, that the Kohanim or the priest, they profane the Shabbat, but they're not guilty. Why? Because the priests offered the sacrifices. And they, those were animal sacrifices. So you better believe not only were they lifting heavy animals, which is something, you know, you're not supposed to carry burdens on Shabbat, but they're carrying heavy animals and putting them on the altar. They're cutting those animals up. They're, they're throwing blood this place, that place. Um, they're singing. They're, 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 they're worshiping before the Lord. This is work. I'm going to tell you right now. Um, operating out of this priestly anointing that God is bringing us into in the truth and the spirit. We work on Shabbat and we don't even have animal sacrifices because Yeshua is the Lamb of, of God. His blood becomes every animal sacrifice for us. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the, 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 the fellowship offering, the guilt offering, the red heifer sacrifice. He is all of them for us. However, um, it is still work. That work of deliverance. Us being delivered first um, or, or receiving that ministry of deliverance and then also helping to facilitate that in people. That's work. And he's saying the priest worked on Shabbat. They were working. And David came and, and ate the holy bread and wasn't even supposed to do it. But he was hungry and he was on the journey that God himself has sent him on. So he used that bread. The Lord gave him that bread as the provision for his journey. And so we see all of these things happening um, that we would understand that what the Lord is saying here, what Yeshua is saying to those priests is that your religion has actually pulled you right out of relationship with God. You're accusing me of breaking Shabbat and my Talmudim of breaking Shabbat when they really weren't. Um, 
in the Torah, it actually allows for you to uh, pick grain out of another person's grain field. You can't harvest the grain because then you're stealing. But you can walk by and just pick the grain and eat it while you're walking. And the Tanakh also does not forbid us from eating on um, Shabbat and, and, and taking that grain and eating it. Now, should we harvest the grain? No, because that's work. But we are supposed to eat on Shabbat. We're supposed to take care of ourselves and bless ourselves and bless others um, that we can worship him on the Shabbat. And so they actually weren't breaking the Shabbat according to the Torah's prescriptions, but there were more additional rules laid out by the rabbis um, later on um, who actually said that you couldn't even... Um, uh, break open the kernels of grain, um, you know, in the in the chaff because that was breaking the Shabbat. When that's not what the Tanakh says, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Torah. Um, they were making additional rules because they were being subject to that spirit of religion, and in that way, they were actually keeping people from getting close to God rather than drawing them close to God. And so he's saying very clearly, I need you to look up this scripture, Hosea six six. I want compassion rather than animal sacrifices. That's the scripture that he's quoting. He's saying you guys don't even understand that. If you were to look back at Hosea, and you would really get it. You would see what I'm trying to say here and, and what the Lord is saying through the prophet Hosea. And you would, instead of trying to keep your religious rules, you would be seeking him in a vital relationship that he can teach you and train you. Um, verse 9 of Matthew chapter 12. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. Now I want to explain to you their synagogue. Because um, you see that in every version. doesn't matter which version you read. It says their synagogue. This is not to separate Yeshua from the Jews of that town because he had his own synagogue that he attended as well. And that would have been um, in Nazareth where he grew up. He's not in the place where he grew up. So it's not his synagogue. He's going to their synagogue. A synagogue uh, was established that there were 10 Jewish families in a region outside of the area where the temple was, which was in Yerushalayim. And they had the synagogue there so that every Shabbat they could worship and they could keep Shabbat, but they could also be trained. Um, they could read the Torah because Torah scrolls were very expensive. So the synagogue would own the Torah and then all the families in the region would be able to benefit from that one Torah scroll as opposed to... Um, each family trying to get a hold of a Torah scroll themselves. Because even nowadays, Torah scrolls cost like $15,000. Um, so clearly, if it's that, that expensive now, you can imagine in Yeshua's day how much that would have cost. So their collective monies were coming together and their offerings. They were able to purchase Torah scroll. And then um, the keeper of that synagogue uh, made sure that someone taught from that Torah scroll. Maybe she Torah scroll every Shabbat. Um, and the families were learning. Um, they also had school there for the young men. Um, where they would learn and grow um, at the at the synagogue in that region, and they were learning from the Torah, but they learned to read, they learned to write directly from the Torah. No other type of um, books were used to train them. They were trained out of God's law. Um, and so it becomes important to note here that those type of references, like their synagogue and things like that, is not to separate Yeshua from the Jews of that time, because again, he was not a Gentile, he was a Jew. It's just to point out that that was in his own synagogue. He had his own synagogue in Nazareth. Um, and this is important as we're breaking down replacement theology, which is another one of the seven um, things that we're being delivered from. And, and I just bless the Lord. This particular Shabbat, this past Shabbat, we actually presented the seven burnt offerings to him because it was Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new month, uh, the fourth month of the biblical year, uh, which is called Tammuz, which means springtime in Babylonia. Um, but at that Rosh Hashanah service, we presented these seven burnt offerings to the Lord. And the first one that we present to him is our replacement theology. And we will keep doing this for quite some time. Every Rosh Hashanah and then each Shabbat that's not a Rosh Hashanah, we're actually going over one of them. Again, this Saturday I'll be teaching on paganism and syncretism. Um, but when we did the, um, the prayer of, for deliverance from um, replacement theology this Shabbat, and then we took... Communion received our grain and drink offerings, because that's what communion is. It's a grain and drink offering, which, again, Yeshua fulfilled, um, because it is his body and it's his blood. Um, we see that in John chapter 6, that it's his body and his blood. And so we partake of that. You see it in Luke uh, chapter 20 as well. Um, but we partake of that communion. And what becomes important to note about that, Luke 22, not 20, is that as we did that, it was such a blessing. I, could, I just felt replacement theology was leaving me. And it was amazing, because there's... We're doing seven burnt offerings, but that one, I know he's done that work in me and he's continuing that work um, to just keep me full of right doctrine because replacement theology has been removed. Um, and that's a big deal because replacement theology, when we read, you know, he went to their synagogue, we see him as Greek, we see Yeshua as Greek, and their synagogue means the synagogue of those Jews. Well, that's not true. It's just the Jews in a different region than the region where he grew up. 
So when we don't have replacement theology in us and we read the, the scriptures, they take on a completely different meaning. That one little word there means something completely different. Uh, when we realize that Yeshua was a Jew and we see he was just going into a different region and that synagogue wasn't his synagogue, then when we think, oh, he's this Greek, blonde, blue-eyed um, demigod, because, of course, there was the system of gods and demigods and humans then in the, in the Greek theology. When we have that wrong theology, um, Hellenism, um, which is, you know, the Greek thinking, is also something we're being delivered from. That's the second thing that the Lord is delivering us from. When that's been removed from us, we see him as a Jew just going into someone else's synagogue. You know, one that he didn't grow up with, one that he did not know in, in particular, but they did things just like the one in, back home in his synagogue. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out to you. I have it Underlined in my Bible that 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 the consciousness you know would be awakened that we would get that when we read about him, um, and we'd understand that through all this time he's a good Jew, <laughs> going to synagogues on Shabbat and ministering to people, and he's received uh, for quite some time until they start to take offense at him, which of course he addressed in Matthew eleven. So starting in in chapter um, twelve of Matthew, reading verse nine, where you should, we're reading again, going on from that place. He went into their synagogue, verse 10. A man there had a shriveled hand, looking for a reason to accuse him of something. They asked him, is healing permitted on Shabbat? Because now remember, these are the same Pharisees that kind of follow him around. Um, they already said that his time of was breaking Shabbat. So they're watching him now to see, is he going to break the Shabbat? Okay. Um, and this is the same Shabbat. This is the same Shabbat. He just moved on to another synagogue. And then, of course, the religious leaders are following him. And they're looking for a way to accuse him. So they say, is healing permitted on Shabbat? Now, it's interesting that they didn't tell him healing is not permitted on Shabbat. Don't heal. Because they've noticed that he's teaching with authority. They're not, he's not listening to them. He's teaching them. So they ask him. You know, it's like a probing question to try to draw him in. Is healing permitted on Shabbat? But he answered, verse 11, If you have a sheep that falls in a pit on Shabbat, which of you wouldn't take hold of it and lift it out? Now, the Tanakh actually teaches us that we're supposed to take the sheep out, even if it's an enemy's sheep, we're supposed to take the sheep out and restore it to the enemy. Um, verse 12, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, what is permitted on Shabbat is to do good. So he's saying if your sheep was stuck, you get them out because you don't want them to die in a, in a hole. I don't want this man to die um, broken. We're saying Shabbat Shalom to him, which is peace, rest, and wholeness. I'm saying being whole on Shabbat. I'm looking at the fact that he has a need, a physical need, his head is shoveled up. Yes, it is right to heal on Shabbat because I'm supposed to do good on Shabbat. And that's what's holy. This is what Yeshua is saying. Verse 13. Then to the man he said, hold out your hand. As he held it out, it became restored as sound as the other one. But the parashim went out and began plotting how they might do away with Yeshua. Again, I told you, those religious leaders that sort of followed him into that synagogue, they're the ones that are mad. Not the regular people, and certainly not the man who's been healed, but the religious leaders who's, who their laws and rules have been broken. Not the Torah. When Paul is addressing those laws and legalistic observance, he's not talking about Torah. He's talking about the, all the rules and laws that these parashim and other religious leaders had created that were uh, in addition to the Torah. Ta to Paul himself said the Torah was good and holy. Um, verse 15, aware of this, he, that be Yeshua, left that area. Many people followed him, and he healed them all, but warned them not to make him known. Now, this is important. He warned them not to make him known, not because he was ashamed of the healing, or he didn't you know, want to get more heat from the religious leaders. He knew that was coming. But as people learned more about the healings, they started to follow him as a healer, and they kept calling him a healer when he really came to teach and preach. He came to, to, to explain the Tanakh, that people would know this covenant that they were committed to and that they would receive all the benefits of the covenant. He did not want people to just come to him for the healing um, and to be known as a healer. He wanted to be known as a teacher, um, which is going to be the, you know, that term rabbi means teacher. He wanted them to come to him to learn the truth because he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. Not that they receive his healing, but they receive his truth. And so he wanted to make sure they were following him for the truth. And we see, of course, that this is not all... Um, that they were following him for, which he addresses later on. But verse 17 continues in Matthew chapter 12. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, the prophet. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom I am well pleased. I will put my spirit on him and he will announce justice to the Gentiles. He will not fight or shout. No one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not snap off a broken reed or snuff out a smoldering wick until he has brought justice through to victory. In him, the Gentiles will put their hope. And that's Isaiah uh, 42, verses 1 through 4. Now, what becomes really important about this 
um, this quote here is that when he's talking about him not snapping off a broken reed. Now remember he asked them in chapter 11, did they go out to see a reed swaying in the wind? or reed swaying in the wind. The wind. This reference to a broken reed is going to be a person who's vulnerable and weak. So if they're broken, this reed is broken, then what it's saying is, is a person is already broken, they're, they're weighed down by their own sin, Yeshua is not going to stomp them down. He's not going to condemn them for their sin. Instead, he himself is going to, um, he's going to, to, to uh, repair them, help them to, to grow strong um, so that they're able to move and sway in the wind but not be broken by the wind. They won't be moved by every wind of doctrine. They won't be broken by every teaching. They won't be condemned by their own sin and wickedness. Instead, they'll be able to raise their head back up. They'll be able to walk again. Um, the Lord had, he was just ministering to me this morning so much on um, what it says in Proverbs that a righteous man falls seven times, yet gets back up. And this becomes so important that what he's saying here is that a person who has fallen in their own sin, he's going to raise them back up. He's not going to leave them broken or stomp them because they are broken by their sin. Same uh, analogy is next, snuffing out a smoldering wick, meaning that it's it's got a little bit of light still on it. It's smoldering. See, there's, 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 the, the smoke is coming up because there's still a little fire there, but it's so low that it's not able to provide any more light. Um, he's not going to snuff it out. He's not going to say, oh, you don't have any light in you. I'm going to get rid of you. Not at all. He's going to blow on it and then let that fire come back to life. This is what Yeshua has come to do. Because there were religious leaders who came before him that really were just stomping people in the mud, condemning them, abusing them, hurting them. And he's not going to do that. He doesn't condemn. He doesn't abuse. He doesn't hurt us. And especially if we're already feeling bad about our sin, he's not going to tear us up. Instead, he's going to build us back up. Not that we would sin again. He wants us to repent. But instead, he'll build us up to a place of health and wholeness, to a place of shalom, that we might be able to be a light to others. Even in that area of our sin, it then becomes a part of our testimony, that we can help somebody else, that they would not fall as we were about to fall. And that's why the Gentiles would put their hope in him, because the religious leaders among the Jews were so harsh and so strict that it was hard for a Gentile to come into the kingdom of God, um, because there was too many rules and laws, much more than what's in the Tanakh. It was uh, additional laws and rules um, that made people religious instead of really righteous. Verse 22. Then some people brought him a man controlled by demons who was blind and mute. And Yeshua healed him so that he could both speak and see. The crowds were astounded and said, this couldn't be the son of David, could it? And of course, son of David is going to be a reference to Mashiach or Messiah. Because as I shared with you, David, of course, is the kingly line that Mashiach comes through. Verse 24. But when the Parashim, or the Pharisees, heard of it, they said, It's only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons, that this man drives out demons. And of course, that means Lord of the Flies. And that Lord of the Flies, or Lord of all demons, is going to be Satan himself. So they're actually saying that he's using the power of Satan to draw out, drive out demons. And it's because they're jealous, because they don't have those miracles that work in them, but they're supposed to be the great leaders of the day. Verse 25. However, knowing what they were thinking, Yeshua said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not survive. If Satan drives out Satan, he's divided against himself. So how can his kingdom survive? Besides, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, which again is Satan, by whom do your people drive them out? Because they were casting out demons. So he's like, you know, whatever power they're using, I'm using the same power. So now you're condemning your own students. So they will be your judges, the students of these Pharisees who have begun to drive out demons. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Again, he's going right back to what he said earlier about knowing that fruit. You're watching my fruit. I'm driving, out, I'm driving out demons. Don't get offended by me because you don't like me. You don't like the way I do stuff. Watch what I'm doing. Watch what comes from me, the fruit that comes from me. And that's going to testify to you that the kingdom of God is at hand. And you need to repent and line up quickly so that you can be a part of the kingdom and not cast out of it. This is what he's saying to them. Verse 29. Or again, how can someone break into a strong man's house and make off with his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? After that, he can ransack his house. So what he's saying is, I couldn't drive out demons if I was on the side of Satan because I have something in common with Satan. Instead, to drive out the demons, I've got to have Satan bound because Satan is going to fight me. He's not going to want me to drive out the demons. So I have to bind up Satan. I have to tie him up, tie his hands, remove his power and authority so that he can't stop me. Then I can drive out those demons that he himself is leading. 
that Satan is leading. Um, this is what he's saying. So clearly I can't be in the same, I can't be in league with Satan if I'm driving out demons. That's what he's saying. Verse 30, those who are not with me are against me, and those who do not gather with me are scattering. So he's like, if you're not working with me, you're working against me. If you're not doing the things that I do, you're, you're messing things up in the kingdom, or you're scattering people, scattering souls, um, and that's something we have to repent of. If we're not doing what God has done um, through Yeshua, then instead of being on the side of Yeshua, we're on the other team. And many of us, including myself, we've been guilty of this so many times, but our own sin, our own foolishness, our own weaknesses. Instead of doing what Yeshua did, we did the exact opposite. And instead of helping the angels to win battles, instead of advancing the kingdom of God, we're actually advancing the kingdom of darkness. We're actually wounding people. We're actually hurting people. And this is what the Lord is trying to deliver us from, that we would be more like him. Um, instead of being religious or sinful, either way, we don't want to be, you know, to either of those extremes, we want to walk the narrow path where we're really actually righteous and holy. Verse 31. Because of this, I tell you that people will be forgiven any sin and blasphemy. But blaspheming, blaspheming the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven. One can say something against the Son of Man and be forgiven. And he's talking about himself. You can talk about me all you want is what he's saying. But whoever keeps on speaking against the Ruach HaKadosh will never be forgiven. Neither in the Olam Hazay, which is the world, the present world, or the Olam Haba, which is the world to come or the age to come. So what he's saying is, listen, you guys can talk about me all you want to. And when you realize you're wrong, I'll forgive you. However, when you say that the works of the Holy Spirit are actually the works of Satan, and you keep saying that, see, in the, in the, the Hebrew, you're always going to hear that keep, the continual. As to when the Greek, you know, when we read the Greek translations, it says anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit. So that means like if you do it one time, you're never forgiven. Oh my goodness, you're going to hell. That's not what he's saying. He says anyone who keeps speaking against the Holy Spirit because he's speaking from this Jewish um, cultural mindset, which is a biblical mindset. It's like you're, you're doing it as an ongoing way of life ongoing way of life that you just keep talking against the Holy Spirit. You just keep saying the stuff that's of the Holy Spirit is not of the Holy Spirit. He's like, you're sinning. It's a terrible sin and it's not going to be forgiven because you continue to stand against the works of God. You're just an obstruction to the advancement of the kingdom of God because you're speaking against what God is doing. Verse 33. If you make a tree good, its fruit will be good. And if you make a tree bad, its fruit will be bad. For a tree will be known by its fruit. So he's saying, I'm trying to change you from the inside. If you don't let me change you from the inside, you're going to keep producing bad fruit. You're going to cast out of the kingdom. And that's what he wants to do in all of us. Deliver us. He'll deliver us in one area and we'll produce good fruit in that area. And then he wants to move into another area and we'll produce good fruit in that area. And then he moves into another area we'll produce good fruit in that area so that all of our fruit will eventually be good. It doesn't all happen immediately like that. But eventually, he wants all of our fruit to be good because he's delivered us in all these areas. So that our hearts, our minds, our flesh, it's all going to line up. Verse 34, he's still talking to these religious leaders. You snakes, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what overflows from the heart. The good person brings forth good things from his store of good. And the evil person brings forth evil things from his store of evil. Moreover, I tell you this. On the day of judgment, people will have to give account for every careless word they have spoken. For by your own words, you will be acquitted, and by your own words, you will be condemned. Oh, now remember, he said to us earlier, judge not, least you be judged. Um, remove the, the beam from your eyes so you can see clearly to take the, the splinter out of your brother's eye. What he's saying here is not only will I judge what you said, because clearly it revealed what was in your heart, but I'm also going to judge how you spoke judgment against other people, because if you spoke mercy over others, then I'm going to give you mercy. If you spoke judgment over others, I'm going to take those same judgmental words that you used about others and I'm going to apply that exact same standard back to you and you're going to be condemned by that standard because you used it against somebody else, I'm going to use it against you because you spoke it out of your mouth. Because our mouths have the power of life and death in them. Verse 38. At this, some of the Torah teachers said, Rabbi, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He replied, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. No, none will be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah, or Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, that's in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the depths of the earth. That's in Sheol, the place of the dead. Why? Because he's going to die. And he actually was dead for three days. Um, verse 41, the people of Nineveh, and those were those that Jonah went to prophesy to, the people of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they turned from their sins to God when Jonah preached. But where it, but what is here now is greater than Jonah. The queen of the south will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Shlomo or Solomon. But one, 
But what is here now is greater than Shlomo or Solomon. And what becomes important to note about these two examples is that Nineveh was a horribly wicked kingdom. It was the, the capital of the kingdom of Assyria. They were horrible to the Jews. They were horrible to all of the good people of the earth. They took over these kingdoms and they were just, just vile people. When Jonah came and preached uh, 40 days and Nineveh would be overturned, they actually listened and they repented. What was important about the Queen of the South is she came to find out about the kingdom. And she listened to Solomon's wisdom and took back with her Torah scrolls. She took back actually a son in her belly because, of course, we get that um, the, the um, Beta Israel in Ethiopia is the, uh, the descendants of Solomon and um, Sheba, the Queen, um, I mean, Makeda, the Queen of Sheba. Um, she takes back with her a son to rule over the kingdom, and they actually become Jews. They, they learn the ways of God. He sent priests or Kohanim with her, and they learn the ways of God, and her whole nation is changed. Um, the whole um, Ethiopian nation is changed because of her connection with Shlomo or Solomon. And what he's saying here is that you guys, you know the scriptures, and you're not even changing when the one who came to fulfill the scriptures, one greater than Solomon, greater than Jonah, or, or Jonah, is before you, and you're not even repenting. You're not even changing. Um, so clearly... What was in you is bad. Now, those of the rest of us may take us some time. Like, we, we might be a, a hot mess some days. But are we changing and growing? Are we staying in that sin? Are we repenting and letting God change us and grow us? Because if so, we're becoming a good tree. And a tree that will not have to be cut down. But these, they were not changing. They were not repenting. They were not growing. And it's, they were not changing. And that was going to be the problem because there was no repentance there. Now, verse 43 when an unclean spirit comes out of a person, it travels through dry country seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says to itself, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds, it finds the house standing empty, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they come and live there so that in the end, the person is worse off than they were before. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. So what he's saying here is that um, on Yom Kippur, they actually put all their sins onto the goat that was for Azazel. We call it the scapegoat, but in Hebrew, it's the goat that's for Azazel. And that's going to be the chief demon um, upon whom it was written all sin. And so what happens here is that Yeshua is saying when that demon goes into the dry, arid place because it's been cast out of the people, um, which happened in Yom Kippur and for us can happen every single day. It's going to eventually try to make its way back to the, to the host it had, the person that it was at that time um, uh, living in. And it's going to see, can I get back into this house? And if there's nothing else there that has taken that place, which should be the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit should have taken the place of that demon. If the Holy Spirit has not come in to take that place, that demon's going to come back. And it's going to bring even more demons with it. So a person who was unrighteous, then they get delivered, eventually it's going to be even more unrighteous when that demon comes back and brings even more demons because they've never been refilled with the Holy Spirit in that area of life. And the reason I keep saying this is because oftentimes we think, oh, I've been saved and I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We've still got all type of vileness in us. Just this horrible mess. So it becomes important to note that um, if we don't allow ourselves to be refilled, then we are going to be in trouble. Now, let's keep going. Verse 46. He was still speaking to the crowd when his mother and brothers appeared outside asking to talk with him. But to the one who had informed him, he replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Pointing to the Talmud. And he said, Look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does what my father in heaven wants, that person is my mother and my brothers and my sisters. All of us are his family because we do what he tells us to do. Now, we might not do it all the time. But we read the commandments, and because we love him, we try to obey his commands. The challenge is, if we don't obey, um, because we are unrepentant, and we just do whatever we want to do, then we're going to find ourselves in a heap of trouble. And we're going to continue on um, to chapter 13. We're going to see how much I can get done today. In chapter 13, um, it begins, verse 1, That same day, Yeshua went out of the house and sat down by the lake. But such a large, a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the crowd stood on the shore. He told them many things in parables. And I love these parables. These parables are so important. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some seed fell alongside the path, and the birds came and ate it up. 
Other seed fell on rocky patches, but there was not much soil. It sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun had risen, the young plants were scorched. And since their roots were not deep, they dried up. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. But others fell into rich soil and produced grain, a hundred or sixty or thirty times as much as had been sown. Those who have ears, let them hear. Then the Talmudim came and asked Yeshua, Why are you speaking to them in parables? He answered, Because it has been given to you to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been given to them. For if anyone who has something will be given more, so that he will have plenty. But from anyone who has nothing, even what he does have will be taken away. Now what that means is, if a person hasn't been a good steward over anything, it doesn't matter what it is, the little bit that they have left, they're going to lose that eventually too. But if a person has been a good steward over something, I'm going to give them more. And right now he's speaking of the word of God and revelation of that word. He's like people who really have searched the scriptures and they've received the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, and they want to know the truth. Those people, I'm going to give them more revelation, more and more and more and more revelation. But for the people who have not even held on to the little bit of revelation that they had, they let the enemy come and snatch it from them. They've been confused by the enemy and they've received that confusion. They've received that doubt. They've received that fear. Those people, they're not going to get any more revelation. And a little bit of revelation that they got at the beginning, they're going to lose that too, which eventually will result in them losing their salvation. Because the first revelation that we need, the first and most important revelation we need is that Yeshua was sent to atone for all of our sins, that we might be one with the Father and live with Him forever. That's the first and important, most important revelation. If we don't receive any of the other revelations that we, come, that we get after that, then that one eventually we're going to lose that too. Then we'll see that He continues on. Verse 13. Here is why I speak to them in parables. They look without seeing and listen without hearing or understanding. That is, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Yeshayahu, which is Isaiah, which says, You will keep on hearing but never understand, and keep on seeing but never perceive, because the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, so as not to see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and do teshuvah, which is to repent, so that I could heal them. So he's, of course, quoting out of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, um, because this is going to be the commissioning of Isaiah when he sees the Lord in the heavens and the cherubim um, are singing. Um, and, and he takes this assignment from the Lord and he's saying, go and preach this to the people um, that they would never hear and never see and never turn back to me. And he's like, how long is that going to be, God? And he says, until the cities lie desolate, meaning that you're going to preach and minister to them, but they're not going to receive any of that ministry. And then I'm going to come and judge them. That was the message that Isaiah had to take out. And Yeshua is saying those, that message is still yet being fulfilled because the Messiah has come, who is the living word of God. We'll see that in John, 1, um, chap, John chapter 1, verse 1. But they've not received that word because they can't see, they can't hear, and their hearts cannot repent so that they can receive this truth. Now, he's going to even um, give more revelation of that parable about the seed sown um, in just a moment. Verse 16. But you, and he's speaking to those of us who prayerfully are not under that curse that has just been spoken. How blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Yes, indeed. I tell you that many a prophet and many Zadik, which is a righteous person, long to see the things you're seeing, but didn't see them. And to hear the things that you're hearing, but did not hear them. And he's speaking clearly of the fact that they are interacting with Mashiach himself. But even more than that, the revelation and the power and the encouragement and the miracles that not only are they seeing, but they're able to minister He's saying so many wanted that, but they weren't in the era. They weren't in the season for that time. So while they prayed for it and they saw it afar off, you know, in the spiritual realm, they themselves were not witnesses of it, but you are witnesses of it. And the times we're living in are even greater times than the times of the Talmudim and the times of Yeshua because we are preparing for his return. And so great things are happening. This is a great and terrible day. Challenges and calamities, but also great opportunities for witnessing and miracles. Verse 18. So listen to what the parable of the sower means. Whoever hears the message about the kingdom but doesn't understand it is like the seed sown along the path. The evil one comes and seizes what is sown in his heart. And that's the one where the birds came and ate the seed. And of course, the seed never even got into the ground itself. So the ground was so hard. Verse 20. The seed sown on rocky ground is like a person who hears the message and accepts it with joy, but has no root in himself. So he stays on for a while. But as soon as some trouble or persecution arises on account of the message, he immediately falls away. 
This is going to be the person who loses their salvation. Remember I told you when he talked about the one who, what you have, um, those who have little, even the little they have will be taken from them. Which means that the only thing they could hold on to is that message of salvation. But they didn't have enough root in them because they didn't receive any of the other messages. Grace, forgiveness, uh, prayer, fasting. They didn't receive any of the other truths. Um, being grafted into Israel. They didn't receive any of those truths. And so when they didn't receive those truths, the result is that even the message of salvation was eventually taken from them and they were uprooted out of their faith. Um, next, verse 22. And so they fall away from the faith. 22. Now the seed sown among thorns stands for someone who hears the message, but it is choked, the message in them, is choked by the worries of the world and the deceitful glamour of wealth so that it produces nothing. So they don't wind up producing any good fruit. You just talked about the good tree and the bad tree. They're not producing any fruit. So they wind up being a bad tree because they don't produce anything because the weeds come, which is the worries of life and the, and the deceitfulness of wealth. Like, you know, you can have this and you can have that. It chokes off the truth of the kingdom of God. Um, verse 23. However, what is sown on rich soil is the one who hears the message and understands it. Such a person will surely bear fruit a hundred or sixty or thirty times what was sown. Which means it might be a really great tree or there might be a small tree. But either way, they're going to bear some fruit. And the Lord is going to be pleased by that because they're not going to lose their salvation and they're going to bring others to the kingdom in some kind of way or another. Verse 24. Prayerfully that, that ministers to all of us and prayerfully those are the people that he's describing as us. Um, we are part of that group. Verse 24. He sure put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads of, um, of grain and formed heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, "Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from?" He answered them, "An enemy has done this." The servants asked him, "Then do you want us to go and pull them up?" But he said, "No, because if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot some of the wheat at the same time. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers to collect the weeds first." And tie them in bundles to be burned, but to gather the wheat into my barn. Now, he's actually going to um, tell us what that is. I'm going I'm to keep reading the parables because he's going to um, interpret it himself. Uh, verse 31. Yeshua put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man takes and sows in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. And if you see it, it's really like the size of like a pinhead. But when it grows up. It is larger than any tree, any garden plant, and becomes a tree, so that the birds flying about come and nest in its branches. And he told them yet another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with a bushel of flour, then waited until the whole batch of dough rose. Because the yeast, of course, worked itself through the whole dough. It's a process. A process we got to patiently wait for. That yeast is not going to be, you know, immediate. Where we immediately become, you know, we're a bad tree, we immediately become a good tree. No, that yeast has got to work itself through us. Um, as we get delivered and delivered and delivered and the Holy Spirit works through us and, and refills new areas of us, we're able to be changed piece by piece. Verse 34. All these things Yeshua said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without using a parable. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will say what has been hidden since the creation of the universe. And that, of course, is the Psalm um, 82, uh, Psalm 78, verse 2. Psalm 78, verse 2. That's the psalm of Asaph. Asaph. Asaph actually was um, ministering that. Verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went to the house. Now this means he was staying at someone's house because of course Yeshua didn't have his own house. He said that uh, birds have nests and foxes have holes but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. We remember that. So clearly he didn't have his own house. He left Mary's home and once he started to, to go throughout the land and preach he didn't buy another home or build another home. He's staying with people. So they go into the house where he's staying. His Talmudim approached him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Now he's explaining it to them because they have a relationship with him. The other people said, oh, that was a good teaching, and they left. But the Talmudim stayed close. These were the ones who didn't complain because the service was so long. <laughs> and go home because now they're famished and they're ready to go watch football. Instead, they stayed after because they wanted to make sure they had the full knowledge and the full understanding. These are the ones that we call hungry. They want to get it. They want to get all of it. They want to get every piece of it. And they're not satisfied until they get it all. So they're not going to be those who don't see and don't hear and whose hearts can, can't do Teshuvah, uh, which is to repent. Instead, they're of those who really are receiving and hearing and understanding um, because they are asking the questions. What does it mean? How do I apply this to my life? Uh, how do I get free of this? Those are the hungry ones. And all of us have to be those kind. Um, hungry after what we know we need. Now, 
Um, this is what he said. Hassan Ali approached him and said to him, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Verse 37. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's Yeshua. He's referred to as the son of man in the book of Daniel. That's why he calls himself that, because he's fulfilling that prophecy. Verse 38. The field is the world. As for the good seed, these are the people who belong to the kingdom, and the weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who sows them is the adversary. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all the things that cause people to sin, and all the people who are far from Torah. And they will throw them into the fiery furnace, where people will wail and grind their teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, it's so important here that you see in the complete Jewish in verse 41, it says the people who, are, who sin and are far from the Torah are the ones who will be cast out of the kingdom. In other versions, you won't see that, that reference to the law. But it is there. Um, in the original Greek, that there is a connection to the law here. But in our translations, because of replacement theology, it just says the people who do evil. Because it doesn't want us, um, that, that mindset, that Greco-Roman mindset, didn't want us to connect back to the Torah, where it was originally written that there was a connection to the law, to the Torah. Um, that that helps us to be righteous, that connection to the Torah. And those who are disconnected from Torah, the lawless ones that Paul speaks about, those people are going to be um, those who are cast out and cast into the place of the fiery furnace. Now, um, we want to be the good seed. Now, the reason he doesn't have the immediate harvest, where he takes the bad seed out and um, the, the weeds and the good seed he keeps, which grows into wheat, is because when they're first growing up, it's hard to tell which is which. Good, good people sometimes do bad things. And bad people sometimes do good things. Because we're all being delivered and healed. It's about the choices that we make in the end of our life. Do we repent? Do we go back to God? Do we confess to others our sin? Do we ask for forgiveness? Um, then that's bearing some good fruit, even though we might have done something bad. But those who are evil will continue on the evil path. And they won't repent. They won't turn from it. They won't ask for forgiveness. They won't ask God to set them back in order. They will allow themselves to continue on the evil path in various decisions. And Ezekiel makes, us, makes it very clear that a righteous man who walks away from his righteousness and then becomes wicked, none of his righteousness will be remembered and only the wickedness he did at the end of his life. Same thing with a wicked man. If he is wicked in the beginning and then he turns from his wickedness and becomes righteous, then only his righteousness will be remembered and his wickedness will no longer be remembered. This is important revelation for us because that's even in the Tanakh. That's before Yeshua comes. That's always been God's heart. That we would continue on the, on the right journey as opposed to being deterred and going on the wrong journey. And even if we are on the wrong path, that we can make a choice and come back to the right path. Um, and those are going to be the good wheat. And so it's not until the end of the harvest that we even know which is which. Because a righteous person can at any moment decide to become a wicked person and just stray the path and stay gone forever. And a wicked person at any, any moment, even at the time of their death, can decide they want to receive the Lord and they want to repent and they can be considered righteous and be a part of the wheat. Um, and so that is encouragement for all of us to stay on the right path, but also to know that there's hope for us and there's hope for others as well. Verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man found it, hid it again, then in great joy went and sold everything he owned and bought that field, meaning that we should give up everything for the kingdom of God. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for fine pearls. On finding one very valuable pearl, he went away, sold everything he owned, and bought it. And this is actually the first verse is going to be about Jews who have an inheritance. You see the field, they have an inheritance. And then the second one about the pearl is going to be about the Gentiles. Because pearls were um, trife, they were unclean, they're in oysters. Oysters are not clean. Um, but that pearl, that's going to be a Gentile who's out, you know, oyster fishing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, he's looking for pearls, that's a Gentile. And so he's saying Jews who have the inheritance are going to sell everything. Even what people tell them is their inheritance. They're going to give it up for this kingdom. And then the Gentiles are going to go out and they're going to give up everything too for this kingdom. Verse 47. Once more, the kingdom of heaven is like, like a net thrown into the lake that caught all kinds of fish. Remember, Jews and Gentiles. Um, when it was full, the fishermen brought the net up onto the shore, sat down and collected the good fish in the baskets, but threw the bad fish away. Of all kinds of fish. Doesn't matter what culture, nation, language, tribe, or tongue. He's collecting good fish and bad fish. No matter where we come from, he's collecting good fish and bad fish. And it determines what's in our heart and what comes out of our mouths will determine which one we are. Um, verse 49. So it will be at the close of the age. Because remember, the harvest isn't now. We still have time to repent. 
The angels will go forth and separate the evil people from among the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where they will be wet, where they will wail and grind their teeth. That's what's going to happen to the evil people. They're going to go to that valley of Hinnom we've been looking at where everything is burned up, where all the trash is burned up, which is right outside Jerusalem, which of course is the, the new Jerusalem, the place where we will live with God forever. Verse 51. Have you understood all these things? Yes, they answered. Then he said to them, so then, I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses. Every Torah teacher who has been made into a Talmud, that is a disciple or a student, for the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a home who brings out of his, store, out of his storage room both new things and old. And in other versions it says new treasures as well as old. So a Torah teacher is going to be a person who knows the Torah. And in other versions it says teacher of the law. Now if Yeshua had done away with the law, why would he be converting teachers of the law into students of the kingdom? Why? Because it's important that you know both. We've got to know the Torah and we've got to know uh, the kingdom. We've got to know the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah because together they make the complete picture. Not one without the other. When you have the keys to the kingdom but you don't understand the treasure you're supposed to be unlocking, which is Israel and the Tanakh, then you're going to unlock portals of hell. And we've seen Christians do that throughout the centuries. Just unlocking demonic portals all over the world because we've got these, key, these keys that we've been using recklessly as opposed to understanding the Torah, which is going to tell us how to be righteous and what we should be unlocking, which is a treasure, which is Israel in um, Exodus chapter 19. He called them his treasured possession. That's what we're to unlock, which is all the truths in its knock that he gave through his people Israel and the truths about Mashiach who came through his people Israel. This is all so important. Um, now, verse 53. When Yeshua had finished these parables, he left and went to his own home. There he taught them in the synagogue in a way that astounded them, so that they asked, where did this man's wisdom and miracles come from? Now, remember that he's in his synagogue now, okay? Remember the other time it was somebody else's synagogue. Verse 55. Isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Miriam and his brothers Yaakov, Yosef, Shimon, and Yehuda? And Yehuda's going to be Jude. And Yaakov is going to be James, because those are their names in the Greek translation. Um, but they, they're mentioning them right here. Um, and his sisters, aren't they all with us? So where does he get all this? Verse 57. And they took offense at him. But Yeshua said to them, the only place people don't respect the prophet is in his hometown and in his own house. And he did few miracles there because of their lack of trust. And it's so important to recognize here that... Um, Yeshua, again, was in his own synagogue and in his own hometown, um, but they didn't, um, they didn't receive him. They didn't receive what he was saying. Um, they, didn't, they didn't receive from him. They didn't receive what was coming out of him because they knew him very well. So they were offended at him. He had already warned, don't take offense at me. Don't, be, don't, be, don't let me be a stumbling block for you where you miss the kingdom because you're looking so much at me, the man. Um, instead, look at what God is doing. Look at my fruit. Um, and so, not only um, did they lose the benefit of this revelation, but of course he was not able to do a whole lot of miracles there. He was only able to do a few because his miracles lined up with the faith of the people there. He wasn't able to do a lot of miracles because their faith did not line up. They doubted him and they were offended by him. So now, I'm going to conclude here. I'm not going to read um, chapter 14, which I really did want to read because you're going to see um, Yochanan, of course, is beheaded because we started with Yochanan, uh, John, in chapter 11. Now we see in chapter 14, Yochanan is beheaded, but because of the hour, um, I'm going to stop and we're going to go back to chapter 14 next week. And what we're going to realize um, here is that that's when Yeshua is actually going to take on that same message um, that John himself uh, was carrying, that message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, which, of course, he was preaching the whole time, um, but there is even more um, power in him and a more, a more fervence. Um, uh, desire that he would continue on with this message because his cousin Yochanan is now killed um, and the person who came to prepare for him is no longer there. And so let us uh, be um, mindful of that and prepare for next week. Um, the chapter that you should read is Isaiah 42. That was actually referred to twice in these scriptures that we read. Um, Isaiah 42 was mentioned a couple of times and you're going to want to read that because it's going to talk about what Mashiach does. What does Mashiach do? How is he... Um, bringing the fullness of, 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 of um, the will of God. How is he bringing the gospel, the good news forth? Um, that's going to become very important that we recognize um, who he is, what he's done. So for next week, you want to read Isaiah 42. Um, that, that's just an additional reading so that you might continue to learn more about the fulfillment um, that Yeshua brought um, when he came to the earth. I look forward to seeing you next week. 
as we prepare to go back into Matthew, starting in Matthew chapter 14. Uh, I want to speak blessings over you. And again, I want to invite you to come next week um, or this Shabbat at 2 p.m. Um, because I'm going to be teaching on paganism and syncretism here at the Truth Center at 15203A Warwick Boulevard in Newport News, Virginia. Um, in the Denby area across from the new Denby Community Center. But also, uh, feel free to visit our website at truthandspirit.org for more information. Be blessed and have a wonderful week.